Well, I think it blocks it all together. In 1996, I went to a, I called it the Scientist Conference in uh, Portland, Oregon, and Zachariah Sitchin was there. Mm -hmm. And on the Monday, they had a roundtable discussion with the scientists, and the buzz for the whole weekend where conference participants were there were, was about this Monday talk. And for some lucky reason, I was invited. And the whole thing was that these scientists had never sat down and spoken to each other. <laughs> they basically publish in a vacuum and in a peer-reviewed journal. And uh, people make comments academically, but they didn't talk to each other. So the first part of this conversation was, what are we going to discuss? And thankfully, they decided they were going to discuss dating methods. And I've always had an issue with that, because carbon-14 dating is notoriously wrong easily contaminated, but doesn't go back very far. And the older something is, the less reliable carbon-14 dating is. And in fact, now we've got an anomaly going on with the new sunspots and going into the new energy fields. It's making carbon-14 dating even worse and, and making things look even younger. And so um, there are all kinds of dating methods that are alternative to it that are being suppressed, okay? But what they specified was that they took the same sample and sent it to 11 different labs, mm -hmm. and they came back with 11 different dates. Sure. So you're not going to tell me that that's reliable. Yeah. So all this stuff with quantitative research methods and reliability and validity, any, anybody can prove what they want, anybody can show what they want to show. Mm -hmm. it's, it's shown that it's a hypothesis from a scientist gets the answer that they're looking mm -hmm. for. There's some and great there's work reasons by, for that in terms yeah. of quantum physics. I was going to say the, 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 the work uh, the Institute of Noetic Sciences and Dean Radin have done around, uh, around that and looking back actually at some experiences that were conducted and, and now understanding a lot better what you just, what you just uh, articulated, which is the variable of ego, which is very rarely, if ever, included in the data of essentially wanting to replicate the answer that you're looking for is probably uh, responsible for you know 90 percent of the results we've had through the scientific method quote unquote and now as we understand more about quantum physics beyond that we understand that the observer actually affects the experiment right and if the answer doesn't fit the paradigm that they're promoting they throw the material out, they throw the study out, and they throw the professor out yeah, yeah. and silence them. Yes. And the whole thing is an agenda to keep their story going. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not science. No, it's more dogmatic than religion, actually, as a matter of fact. And, and that brings, like, I'd like to know from you, because, again, there's, you know, the, the standard answer about how old the pyramids are seems to be around 5,000. You know, this is kind of the, the, you know, the areas that you hear and it seems to have been revised. I know uh, uh, Dr. Uh, or Robert Boval has done a lot of work around this. But when, when people ask you, uh, you know, Dr. Carmen Bolter, how old do you believe not only these pyramids but Egyptian culture is? What, what do you tell them? Well, I actually like to avoid that question because it's not, you can't prove it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a hunch and I have my reasons for having that. It's also connected to past life memories. And I know that the pyramids, the platforms that the pyramids are on, were there long, long before the pyramids were there. And that fits with the Orion constellation theory. But you know, a date that I'm comfortable with, personally in myself, mm -hmm. 50,000 years ago. Yeah, which, which is, is very relevant for a few reasons. One being what you've touched on a lot in, in, in your work, as well as uh, in the pyramid code, as well as various interviews, that because if, if we understand the precession of the equinox cycle, this 26,000 year cycle that people have been talking obviously a lot about these days as we sort of uh, contemplate 2012, if, if the pyramids are only a few, you know, 5,000 years old, then it's, it's impossible to say that we'd be, we were once, they were once in a golden age, you know, and then cycled into what we are now and we're cycling back or something along those lines. This, this is, leads me to, uh, to, to how you've talked about what the Egyptian culture was like at the time, that they were sort of, or not sort of, were in a golden age. They lived in a, uh, understanding our interconnectedness versus the illusion of separateness. Yes, and 2450 BC is the date for the Great Pyramid that they give it. And that's in the middle of the Iron Age. And it just, it doesn't add up. A, because it's a desert there now. And if we look at climato climatological data, 
we're going to find that, first of all, it was lush. Okay, mm -hmm. there were trees. The river, the Nile River ran right in front of the pyramids. The evidence is there because the old riverbed is there, and now it's percolating back up in front of the Sphinx. Okay, so that's because the water table is underneath it. And now the river is eight miles to the east of the Sphinx. Now, how long does it take a river to migrate eight miles? A long time. A long time, yes. A long time. It, it migrates inches, perhaps, in a decade or whatever. And so eight miles is, 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 is a long, long time. So if, if it was lush, if the river was running in front of it, it has to have been older. It would have been built in a golden age when there was more wisdom, more ability, um, anti-gravity and this sort of thing, bilocation, the transmutation of the atom, these sorts of abilities that we see percolating into TVs, stories and, and, and movies are not science fiction. It's science, not fiction, yeah. okay? And so we are so dumbed down right now that we can't even conceive of them being able to do this sort of thing. But in a golden age, this was normal. And, and, and what's interesting now about, you know, the, the talk of ages, the yuga cycle, and, and, and understanding ancient civilizations is, uh, the, are the prophecies. And obviously a lot of those prophecies, prophecies relate to this particular time we're in, either directly to 2012 through the Mayans or specifically to these times. Where do the Egyptians and their quote-unquote prophecies uh, hold this particular time we're in, and, and how do you see the connection between Egypt and 2012? Well, thank you very much for that question, because the actual alignment that I've seen through Starry Night Pro, which is a whole map of the sky, 100,000 years back and 100,000 years forward, has the exact alignment B at Giza, sunset, December 21st, 2012. Not 11 and 11 in the morning, not yeah. another year, not October 28th, 2011. And so the Mayans have a representation in Egypt that the Mayan calendar was known. Now, what this alignment is, is the bottom of the darkest part of the cycle, the Iron Age. Now, the Egyptians also have five different ages that they talk about. Amun is the dark, the dark age, and Heper is the dawn. Well, Amun, Amen, the Amun-Ra, mm. all of this is like the, the, the Amun priesthood was corrupt like the Catholic Church. Yeah. And they, it was, they know it to be dark. And so, you know, the Egyptians fully understood that humanity went through different phases, that deteriorated culture, that unplugged DNA, that dumbed us down, and then it would rise back up into having more abilities, having more connections, being psychic, 12-strand DNA, up into the Golden Age. And they actually worried when they were in the Golden Age that they would deteriorate. And some people say that the pyramids were meant to sustain the energy, to try to prop up the consciousness of humanity by generating energy on the whole telluric grid system of the planet. And there are pyramids all over the world, and they're switched off now. But when they were switched on, they could have sustained this energy as the, energy, the natural energy of the Golden Age was waning. And so I really think that this whole system that was Grand Central Station right at the Great Pyramid mm. um, was to prop up this energy that we knew we were going to lose. And, and, and to understand that, uh, that relationship between the pyramids and, let's say, Grand Central Station in Egypt, but obviously various other uh, depots around the world, now that we understand ley lines and the energy centers in the world, and not coincidentally, all of these structures are built in these specific areas, areas that for you know, generations we didn't understand uh, you know, the energy output of these particular regions of the world, that now also makes sense because they are interconnected whether these cultures intermingled or not. Well, yes, and the other thing is that all around the world, these pyramidal structures align with stars. Yes. The Pleiades, Orion, Sirius, Cygnus, all of this is connected. And so when you look at a map of where the pyramids are in mm -hmm. Egypt, they look like they're just scattered around. But that's not so. There's an absolute... Um, sky ground correlation. Mm. But it's even more fascinating than that in that the combat that with you have Sirius, Orion, the Pleiades, and Cygnus, this configuration through Starry Night never separates. 
And so if you take any other star system mm -hmm. and, and plug it in and run it, you can run it like a movie backwards and forwards. These star systems are in different orbits and they all disconnect. But those ones stay connected. So if you look at the ceiling of the Temple of Dendera, you see Isis, who represents Sirius, mm -hmm. standing behind Orion, sorry, Osiris, mm -hmm. who represents Orion, with his sword pointing up to the Pleiades and little stars on the ceiling. And, um, and that's because that's how the configuration of stars works. Now, how they understood that mm -hmm. is even more fascinating. But you know what? We don't have to know how the television works to turn it on yeah. or the radio. Yeah. We don't know how it works. But what I mean, does it stop us from turning it on? What do, like, with this ridiculous level of uh, astonishing evidence of a relationship to not only a, maybe even a greater understanding of astronomy and cosmology than we have now, certainly of geometry, certainly of math, uh, and, and obviously, we could get into engineering and other areas and energy. When, when, you talk, when you hear or talk to skeptics that say, that dismiss that, or, or at the very least, try to marginalize it as, you know, something maybe we don't fully understand, it, but it's myth or it's folklore. Okay, they, they seem to have an understanding. Like, what, what is their main argument? Like, how could you refute that level of evidence, I guess, is my question. Well, I have this little saying that faster can see slower, but slower can't see faster. And I'm talking about a vibrational level of, let's say, an angelic being is a mm -hmm. very fast, fine vibration, mm -hmm. right? And so what these people, I'm sorry, you're telling me is that they're, they're dense. If they can't see something that's more refined, I actually don't want to hang out with them or even talk to them because they're not going to get it anyway. Yeah. So I want to talk to people who've got the ears to hear it, okay? Yeah. And so... The idea that the pyramids were built by slaves whipping and rolling on, you know, these stones are 200 tons. Mm -hmm. Men have trouble moving a stone that's 25 pounds. Yeah. And cranes have a, like, today's, you know, highly technological cranes cannot lift most of these, this tonnage that we see in, not only in, in Egypt, parts of South America, certainly those, the stones in Lebanon uh, are, you know, if, uh, approaching a thousand tons, yet when we, when even people will acknowledge that, but then still will find a way to say, okay, maybe that's true, but still there's no way they were using energy to move these stones into place because that's just preposterous. Well, what we're doing is we're looking through patriarchal lenses. You know, we think of slaves. We've got slaves. We are mm. slaves, yeah. right? But the, the Egyptians didn't think of it that way. But there's two cases in point here. One is the pyramid at Abu Rausch, and the other is something like Machu Picchu. That Machu Picchu, the temples, are at 12,000 feet up in the yes, air. Yes. Abu Rausch is a, is a mountain with a pyramid on the top. So what the Egyptians did is they, they closed the door. They, they closed the, there's no road. There's no way to get up there. Mm -hmm. And they want to just forget about it because the, pyram the, the rocks would have to come up a mountain before they went up the pyramid. Mm -hmm. So it's bad enough when, and then they call it the Giza Plateau. Yeah. Well, if you stand there, it's not, it's not flat. But the idea is to promote this thing. You know? But the other thing mm -hmm. is if you were just putting the rocks and stones up with slaves and ramps and everything, mm -hmm. where, are the, where are the slaves gonna stand to put the capstone on? Yeah, and that's... how long do these ramps have to be? And how much food would you have to produce? Now, when you look at the, however, 2.3 million stones, you would have to be setting one of these uh, 60 to 200,000 ton stones, one per minute, 24 hours a day, you know, for 20 years. Yeah. Well, where are you going to get, you know, the slave driver and, and the number of slaves, and they know they would hurt their back and they have to yeah. eat and people get sick. And, you know, it just, it doesn't add up in any yeah. way, shape or form. And not only that, we, I said it before, not only do we not have the technology to build the pyramids today, we don't have the technology to take them down.